Um, it's it's uh, things we just couldn't do. Um, just if we were doing one of our, as it was, sort of Saturday talks of a year ago. So this is this is really nice. We've got, I feel like we've got new friends uh, from all over. It's the sixth in our series. It's the last of our disparate romantics uh, for the moment. Um, it's nice to think what uh, Dorothy records on this day uh, in 1800. Walk to Keswick, snow upon the ground, a very fine day, ate bread and ale at John Stanley's, found Coleridge better, stayed at Keswick till Sunday the 14th of December. And it, it's just, isn't it, how Dorothy records just walk to Keswick as if that's what you do. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's 13 miles uh, in the snow. And I'm sure there's a day um, when they walk to Keswick and back in the same day. I'm sure there is. If anybody on, on the chat can confirm that or deny that, I would be very pleased to, to know one way or the other. Uh, my name is Jeff Cowton, uh, Curator and Head of Learning at Wordsworth Grasmere. Uh, this week I'm in the reading room. Um, if this is your first webinar uh, or you're new to Wordsworth Grasmere, uh, I'm in the building uh, where we have 70,000 books, manuscripts and pictures. Um, and it's also uh, where we have our research facility. It's where we have groups of students of, of uh, school groups. Um, and it's also where we have events. So it's, it's a place of, uh, of treasures, but it's also a place of activity and learning. Um, we, we wondered, didn't we, uh, Simon, how many people would see us through to six? And we've, we've, I think we found the answer uh, to that. I just wondered whether anybody bought all of the books so far. Um, <laughs> maybe that's not something you want to say publicly. But uh, I wonder how many people have bought books uh, as a result of the talk, because we've had some, we've had some brilliant books. Um, um, someone actually followed last week's uh, Sayeko's talk, and they tried to find the first book that she published, um, and they found it for a price of 150 pounds, and that was the the cheapest they could find it. So um, keep looking, <laughs> so I might say. Um, it's 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 wonderful to welcome Professor Nick Mason. Um, from Brigham Young University. Early afternoon, Nick, I think you said? Yeah, just right after lunchtime. So. Well, thank you for being with us uh, today. Um, last week, we focused on Wordsworth Country and Wordsworth Shire. Um, we followed the, uh, the journey of Wordsworthian tourism um, from the early 19th century through to the 20th. And one of the key points in that was the publication of the Dudden Sonnets in 1820. And as part of that, um, there was a topographical description of the Lake District published. And this is one of the things that helped establish Wordsworth as the poet of the area. Well, that topographical description uh, became the guide to the lakes. And as Wordsworth tells us in that book, it had been published in a different form somewhat earlier. And it's the journey from that first form to the 1820 to the guide that we're going to be following this evening. And we'll particularly, one of the highlights is going to be a, a website uh, that's being created by Nick, by colleagues, including Paul Westover at Brigham Young, and we'll be seeing that um, guided through it by Nick later on. However, um, the only way, I think I'm right in saying this, the only way you can get um, an 18, the, the version of the 1820 uh, topographical guide is through this book. Um, let's see if I can make that visible on the screen. Um, this is uh, the Country of the Lakes in 1820. Um, it's a Words of Trust publication. It's, uh, it was published to mark the bicentenary, obviously, 2020. It's the topographical guide, but it's also wonderfully illustrated with watercolours from our collection. Um, I don't know how many there are. I mean, there must be 30, 40, 50 watercolours uh, illustrated in here. So as well as being the description, you get like the highlights of our watercolour collection. And they're all catalogued. And if it's possible to read that, you might see that at the end of the entries, the, the attribution WW Spooner Charitable Trust. Um, and that trust has helped the development of our watercolor collection immensely. They've also sponsored this book so that the, all the price of it goes to the trust. But the other great reason to buy it is an essay by Dr. Cecilia Powell, the great Turner scholar, scholar of English watercolors. And so, for the bargain price, the special price tonight of £9.60, uh, you can have this, this beautiful book. Um, I think Hannah's going to put it in the chat how you do it, but it's shop at wordsworth.org.uk. So really, really wonderful book, um, which we, we would think would make it, uh, we always say, don't we, an ideal Christmas present. I won't say it. Um, 
And as always, it's a great pleasure to co-host this with Simon Bainbridge. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Nick. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, as hopefully people will, will have gathered by now, Simon Bainbridge from Lancaster University. I'm a trustee of the Wordsworth Trust and also I've been the lead educator on William Wordsworth Poetry, People and Place. And it's very nice um, to see a couple of people whose names I recognise um, from that online course, Christine Russell and uh, Janet O'Donnell joining us again this week. And I'm sure there are others of, of you out there. So um, great that you've been able to continue um, your interest in words were through the course and then on, on to these um, events. I just, I mean, Jeff was saying he wouldn't say, he wasn't going to say this is the ideal Christmas present. Uh, it's a really good Christmas present. Though. I, am <laughs> gonna get, I am going to get this to my mum. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely present to give to somebody for uh, under £10. I mean, that's a brilliant, uh, brilliant price. So I'm definitely going to get that from her. She's not watching tonight, so I'm not spoiled anything. Uh, <laughs> just yet. She does try to come along to these events, but hasn't been able to. Uh, today. Just, just to remind you uh, as well, um, we'd be very happy to take any of your questions or comments, um, so do please let us have those um, through the chat box uh, and we'll put those to Nick or try and deal with them. Also, because this is the last in the series, we'd really like to know what you thought about the series um, so far. You know, what have you enjoyed about what we've been doing? You know, what would you do differently? Um, and I guess it'd be particularly useful for us to know if you'd like us to consider doing more events like this. And if so, what sort of topics might we cover? You know, the particular areas related to William or, or Dorothy, whose anniversary it is, of course, next year, or um, the Lake District that you'd like us to, uh, to think about, or, or, you know, the particular speakers you have, you have in mind. Uh, just to say, for us, the chat box ends when the... Um, the seminar itself ends so do please let us have those uh, points in advance of the end of the seminar otherwise unfortunately they just just sort of get cut off you can send them just to us as all panelists or you can send them to everybody if you like by I think it's all panelists and attendees as Hannah has um, already said um, the usual format tonight um, Jeff and I are going to be in conversation with Nick um, uh, about the book that becomes known as Wordsworth's Guide to the lakes. We'll aim to take a five minute break at about quarter past eight. Um, there's an awful lot of very uh, special material to get through uh, tonight so we'll just we'll play that um, by ear because we're going to, we, as I say, we're going to be looking at some very special items from the collection that are right at the heart of what uh, Nick has been doing. Um, but do let us have your, your questions by half time if you can because then we can show we, we try and cover them uh, for Nick um, and then we'll end by asking Nick to read a, a part of the, uh, of the guide. Also, uh, just a reminder that we're recording this event, uh, but only the panellists will be visible and it will only be their faces and voices uh, that are recorded. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Mason, who is Professor of English at Brigham Young University, where he's taught since 1999. He specialises in 18th and 19th century British literature, especially Romanticism, book and periodical studies, and contemporary European literature and culture. His recent publications include a co-edited collection with Tom Mole on romantic periodicals in the 21st century, a scholarly edition with Paul Westover and Shannon Stimpson of William Wordsworth's Guide to the Lakes, which of course is what we're going to talk about tonight, a collaborative book on interacting with print, elements of reading in the era of print saturation, and the book Literary Advertising and the Shaping of British Romanticism. He's also the editor with Matt Mason of a classroom edition of Edward Kimber's The History of the Life and Adventures of Mr. Anderson, the editor of the six volume collection Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, and the first volume of British Satire 1785 to 1840. Nick's currently completing a digital edition of Dorothy Wordsworth's Lake District Writings, co-edited with Paul Westover and Michelle Levy, uh, and he's beginning a new book on the production, sale and reception of Romantic Era, era Literary Periodicals. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Nick, and I think as Jeff could tell us, Nick's someone who has a, a, a long-standing relationship with the Trust. Yeah, this, this is a... Um... Before I just <laughs> mentioned that, someone's already spotted your statue in the background, Nick. 
Um, so that's, we'll, I, saw that, I saw Penny Bradshaw yeah. did that. Uh, she probably like one of the five living people who would recognize <laughs> that as John Wilson. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So just just going back, uh, sort of a little personal history. Um, I think we we first met. It was 2011, 2012, you were on a research visit to Grasmere and, and that the beginning of that relationship um, has led to great things for the trust uh, in terms of the things we've done together. But also, you, I know you've personally encouraged our work, you've sought support for our work and you've been a great advocate for our work. So it's, it's, very, it's very gratifying to be able to have this opportunity to say thank you to you um, and colleagues at Brigham Young. But I wonder, um, if I could just ask sort of your memories of it and, and how the relationship seems to you. Um, oh, it's been one of the highlights of my professional life of the last decade. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a romanticist. I had come to the Lake District regularly um, with student groups or for research and so forth, but um, getting to work closely with you and others at the Trust, um, I mean, Becky Turner, Melissa Mitchell, others, um, has been um, just incredibly gratifying. And it's also, you know, as we'll find out today, has saved me from a lot of uh, dumb scholarly mistakes, uh, having good friends on the other end who are there to, to pitch in. Um, just as gratifying um, has been seeing all of the sort of amazing experience BYU students have had as a result of um, this partnership um, you know, which just began with a small band of us working on the Guide to the Lakes. And I think by this point, um, we've had, um, at least before COVID, uh, slowed things down. Um, we've had probably 30 BYU students who've done three-month internships with you there at the Jerwood Center. And I'm guessing, I was running the numbers, I'm guessing we're over a thousand students who are participating in our, our London Center programs who've got to spend a, at least an afternoon with you looking at manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. Um, it's really, really nice to hear about those kinds of relationships and especially to manage to, um, to do such productive work from the trust when at such geographical dis distance. It's a great example of, uh, of what can work through these partnerships. So I wonder if I might ask you, Nick, um, to begin by um, introducing us to the work now known as, or generally known as, Wordsworth's Guide to the Lakes, but it doesn't always have that title. And, and perhaps tell us just a bit about how, how you see it fitting into the sort of emerging, developing genre of the Lake District Guide. Because to, to me, it seems, you know, unlike some of the other guides with which people will be familiar, which are, are perhaps more like the kind of guide that we're used to now, um, this feels almost more, more like a sort of philosoph philosophical essay about the Lake District on Wordsworth's part? Uh, you know, yeah, yes and no. Um, it, it sort of depends on which guide we're talking about. Um, so when we, what we call the Guide to the Lakes uh, generally has been known over the last at least 100 years, uh, almost exclusively by the uh, 1835 edition, which so Wordsworth produced five editions of this, first of which came out in 1810. None of them bore the title literally, you know, the guide to the lakes. That was kind of later shortening of his various versions. Um, but it was this 1835 edition that uh, Jeff has just pulled up here, uh, which um, I don't know, Jeff, how many copies of the 1835 edition do you have? You have five? Oh, 15 maybe. 15? Mm -hmm. um, so this is, uh, is, is that the 35? Okay, yeah, yeah. so that's- so this is the one that's the, you know, to answer Simon's question, this is the one that's the closest to what uh, readers of the time and, and frankly ours, people who use a Rick C Steve's guide or Fromer's guide or something like that would expect in a guidebook. So this is the first of the five editions that's, that's you know, right from the heading is called a guide book. And then you'll see what he's done here. Um, I'm glad you turned to that page, Jeff. So this section um, titled Directions and Information for the Tourist in previous editions um, was much shorter and had appeared um, near the end of the book. And so as part of this 1835 kind of repackaging of it, finally into kind of full-blown guidebook status, um, Wordsworth and his now local publishers in Kendall 
um, move that to the very beginning. So uh, um, almost as if, you know, um, well, literally as if this was going to be sold to people who were passing through Kendall, kind of the south eastern gateway to the lakes and would purchase it there as, as more or less their, you know, the, the travel itinerary that they were going to follow in the weeks ahead. And then um, other features, so Jeff, if you'll turn to the next um, page, um, or the next page of the, the contents there, you'll notice that the, in the rear of the book, um, with each kind of passing version of this, he began, he added more and more content and much of which was again in that sort of guidebook tradition. So these excursions, which we'll talk about more, um, I think probably in the later part of today, uh, that you see the excursions to the top of Scafell and, and on the banks of Oldswater, those were actually written by Dorothy, um, as we'll discuss. But then, Jeff, if you could turn to the itinerary there that showed that it shows, this is probably the thing that, uh, I'm sorry, it's like, I'm, it's at the very rear uh, of the book. It's, I think it's at page 135. Okay, yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah, so any of those pages in there will work. So these are, I mean, this is about as guidebook as it gets. I mean, this is the equivalent of your Rick Steves guidebook that tells you how to get from the airport to the central <laughs> city. Um, and he, they built into this 1835 edition, all of the coach, uh, schedules for the area. And of course, the, the railway, railway hadn't come quite yet. Um, but again, this is, in many ways, these are the utilitarian features of the book. Um, but what makes it stand out from the others, to go back to Simon's question, um, is that in the heart of it, all the sections we, that we'll look at more carefully uh, today, is where Wordsworth's really using the eye of the native, of the scholar, and you know, in ways above all, the poet, to think carefully about his native region, to help people see it uh, with new eyes and experience it in new ways. And what am I missing? Am I missing? I, I can't. I don't think in this edition yet we had a map. Is there a map in this edition? We do actually. Yeah. Um, here we are. I've just got to be a bit careful doing this. There we I mean, that, that is like literally comparable to what you would get mm. if you buy, bought like a Fromer's uh, New York City guide or something where it would be, you know, the fold out that's bound into the main text. So that's, I mean, fascinating, Nick, to hear about these two different elements of the guide and obviously to see it at the same time, you know, on the one hand, as you said, sort of utilitarian, useful elements, how long it's going to take you to get from Lancaster to Kendall, um, how you find your way, even that, I, I, I'd never realised that, that in a way, it's particularly marketed for, or presented for readers who might buy it as they enter the southeast of the Lake District, because they're coming from, from that direction. Mix then with, as you, as you say, um, the, the sort of assessments from you know, the great dweller in the Lake District's uh, words with, how, how does he find himself producing a, a book like this? What's, what's the sort of history of its origins? Um, it, it's fascinating in ways, uh, just to think about um, someone we don't associate with uh, utilitarian, mm -hmm. you know, this is our great poet of, I, I, you know, I only wrote right from the, the spontaneity of the moment. Um, we don't think of him as writing prose, even though he wrote some wonderful works of prose. Um, so the, the, the backstory is, I mean, Wordsworth uh, grew up in the lakes during a period in which the Lake District is uh, Seiko and Paul Westover and others have, have written well about, um, were discovering the lakes. Um, this is Thomas Gray's uh, you know, famous uh, introduction to the region, West's great guidebook. And so he knew this genre um, but most of those who'd written about it were outsiders, um, were people who were, you know, Thomas Gray, Cambridge scholar, um, who, who were there more as travelers than as um, natives of the region. And um, so we have accounts of Wordsworth um, as early as uh, 1807, 1808. Um, there's a diary entry. He has dinner with Lady Holland, um, this kind of grandee of the London liberal establishment who's traveling through the lakes invites him to dinner 
And she records in her journal that night about how Wordsworth said that he was preparing a guidebook to the region. Then we find a year, a year later, actually, uh, he gets a, a letter from a, largely a stranger who's saying, hey, why, why don't you write a guide to the books, I'd, a guide to the lakes, I'd love this. And Wordsworth at that point demurs um, and says, no, I don't think I could ever do this. I mean, A, I don't, I don't do things that are utilitarian. B, I'm, I'm just so close to the subject that it would, I, I just don't think I could do it without driving myself nuts in a certain a, a level. Um, and that's in, um, he writes, he says as much in late 1808. Um, well, fast forward six months later, and um, this is what we can piece together, again, thanks to a lot of the um, trove of, of manuscripts that have kind of been preserved in the Jerwood. Um, we have a, a letter, and this is you know, literally the letter uh, that Joseph Wilkinson, um, so Wilkinson was a, a reverend um, who had up through 1804 lived near Keswick um, and during that time had become friendly with uh, the Coleridges and the Southies uh, who lived in that area. Um, since then he had moved to Norfolk um, and in this letter we, which it's very clear from the context that this was part of a series of back and forth between uh, Wilkinson and Coleridge, but essentially Wilkinson was an amateur artist who kind of had this longtime dream of publishing his um, sketches of the Lake District. And he was getting ready to move forward with this project, but kind of doubted whether he um, had the, the writing skills um, to write the, the, the prose uh, accompaniment to it. And so he reaches out to his old friend Coleridge um, in the spring of 1809. Um, and again, from the context, my, at least my sense of it is that it, he originally asked Coleridge to write this for him. Coleridge at the time was kind of in over his head. He was getting ready to, to launch The Friend, his own periodical, and um, brings in word. And, you know, at the time, he also, by the way, in, in May 1809, is living primarily at Dove or at uh, yeah, uh, well, he's living at, at uh, they're at Allen Bank at the time um, in Grasmere. And um, one way or another, Wordsworth gets brought in. Um, and this is the letter in which um, apparently Wordsworth had expressed concerns about competing with another edition um, by a friend of his. It's on the front page. Um, yeah, and yeah. Wilkinson here writes at the bottom of this, I'm just returned from, uh, from town or London where I have been making arrangements for my publication as I have seen some of Mr. Green. So this is a William Green, Ambleside artist who was doing his own guidebook. Um, as I've seen some of his numbers, I will be obliged to you if you would tell our friend Wordsworth that no two works descriptive um, over to the next page. Yeah. Um, uh, of the same country can be more different or less likely to interfere with each other than his and mine. Um, but I shall write to Mr. Wordsworth in a few days more fully. So Wordsworth had some concerns that needed to be worked through, but um, it, you know, apparently this letter um, was enough um, to persuade Wordsworth to, to sign on. Now, it's a it, one part of the story that I've been I've tried to track down the best I could, and I, I so far I've come up empty, um, is exactly what the offer was. I think it's fairly clear that this wasn't, Wordsworth wasn't doing this just purely as a, as a kind deed uh, to an old acquaintance. Um, there, there was compensation involved in this. Um, in fact, the consensus in, among um, most Wordsworth biographers has been that Wordsworth only agreed to do it for the sake of money. Um, but that, that seems to me um, only part of the story. I think very clearly, yes, he wanted, he needed the pay. The, the family was growing. They were in fairly desperate straits financially in, eight, in early 1809. Um, but beyond that, I mean, again, is, you know, to go back to what you're saying, what we were discussing before, Simon, 
I mean, Wordsworth had been thinking about writing something like this. So this was kind of an occasion that it fell into his lap to do something and, and better yet, for someone who'd made so little money for his writing to this point, here was a chance to do it for, for guaranteed pay. And I think there's also a level at which we could say that um, Wordsworth may well have um, come into it with a high opinion of Wilkinson's art. Um, Wilkinson in 1795 had um, put together a first series of sketches of the Lake District, the only surviving copy of which um, is the one that Jeff's showing us here, um, which were, Jeff, do you know, I mean, I, I, we may have talked about this at some point. Um, do you know who water, who did the watercoloring or the story on that? In, in these drawings here? Yes. I'd always assume this is Wilkinson right through. Okay. These are, these are his watercolors. Okay. There's a, there's a nice moment that uh, in Coleridge's notebook where they, they, they're in the 1803 travels to Scotland and they come across the cobbler uh, by O'Hurlan and Coleridge said, I recognize it from seeing a drawing by Wilkinson. So I'm guessing, you know, that their drawings were shared because uh, these were some of the ones that were shared. Yeah, and we know that, um, again, back in that moment around 1800 to 1803 or so, um, there are numerous accounts, including in the in the Grasmere Journal. Dorothy uh, mentions they're spending time with the Wilkinsons, and and in one letter she mentions receiving some of Wilkins' uh, sketches by mail. And so, um, for reason we'll discuss in a minute that Wordsworth ended up um, uh, having a less favorable view of Wilkinson's art um, in the years ahead. But early on, I think I think he uh, admired. Um, many of these sketches, um, especially again from kind of a, an amateur uh, painter from the region. Fantastic, Nick. That's such an interesting answer, and uh, I mean it's lovely to have it with the uh, uh, you know just amazing to me, isn't it, to be able to move from the uh, the printed guide book back to that early letter, the origins of the whole project, and to to see these pictures too. Again, it's not how we think of Wordsworth, is it? Um, you know, we think of the poet of the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings of him wandering lonely as a cloud. But here we've got him um, you know, writing, the suggestion is sort of writing for money, um, you know, kind of pen for hire. Um, what's he like in that role? Is he, is he, you know, does he take to this sense of being a, you know, almost a jobbing writer rather than an inspired poet? Um, yes and no. Uh, so, again, we, we can only go by the, you know, the, the few stray documents that survived, letters and, and so forth. We have no surviving letters between uh, Wilkinson and Wordsworth directly, other than one that we'll look at, just a kind of a, a note on a manuscript. Um, but we know that um, it's about... It, it, it's likely the end of June 1809 that Wordsworth signs on to this project. And he's essentially agreed to provide two sets of text. So the first set of text will be a general essay on the Lake District, which will be at the, uh, which will just introduce or per, those who are purchasing Wilkinson's um, print collection or collection of prints um, to the region. And for that, by and large, he was he could do what he wanted. I mean, in many ways, this was the opportunity he'd been looking for. Mm -hmm. And so most of the best known sections of the guide come from that. He, he got to work on that right away. Um, even though, again, you know, if we, we put our timeline in place here, uh, late June 1809 is when he signs off on this. We know from other letters that like most of their summers, um, the words were just uh, over whelmed by visitors um, into September. And so he, um, Dorothy writes at one point, he got very little writing done. And yet by the mid-November, um, we have a letter from Dorothy in which she says that um, Sarah, uh, Sarah Hutchinson is making essentially a fair copy of Wordsworth's introductory essay, which is, 18,000 words, um, you know, so this, and there's no indication anywhere that Wordsworth um, 
was begrudging the job at that point. I mean, he seems to have thrown himself into it and, and quite appreciate it. So that, that part of the, the commission, if you will, went quite smoothly. Um, it was after that where things uh, fell apart. Um, the, the, the second part of the commission was that um, Wordsworth would, would supply um, descriptions for, uh, and a part of this is we're just piecing this together, but it, but it seems like the task based upon the genre of these books of prints was that for every plate, he would write a paragraph, a short paragraph, um, describing the scene, the area, what it was famous for, uh, and so forth. Um, and the process was going to be that, um, so when Wilkinson finished his sketches, I mean, or revised them, he then sent them to the engraver in London. The engraver would send proofs of this and uh, to Wordsworth. And the reason we know this is, again, another one of the great treasures there um, the guy, Jeff, do you, uh, do you have the, um, the, the, the pencil uh, preparatory sketches or the, uh, uh, maybe we're talking about, maybe there are two sets of, of um, well, items. It's a, nice, it's a nice moment to bring in, bring in this. Uh, this is one of the sketches um, that, that actually existed in multiple before becoming a sketch, before becoming an entry. And uh, we didn't have this in there from your last visit. This is a bequest to us from uh, Charles and Mary Puglia, who uh, has something about 18 original Wilkinson watercolors and uh, bequeathed them to us. So this is a wonderful moment just to, just to share this. So this is a drawing of a wasp there, a watercolor drawing of a wasp there. Um, sorry, it's a bit of showing the, in the light with the, with the glass on it. So we've memorized that image and then move it across to this one. This is the preparatory drawing that you're talking about, made for the etching, um, which, is, which is similar, um, but I think it's got an extended pattern on the side of the lake, uh, this one in the etching. Um, so these are the preparatory drawings, at the same size as the etchings. Uh, there are figures in the drawing not in the original watercolor, and we've remarked before, haven't we, um, that some of these drawings have got figures in the margin. So it's, it's like as if Wilkinson didn't draw the figures, and uh, someone else drew the figures, and Wilkinson was responsible for the landscape. Jeff, do you, um, we, um, we, can, I, we can hear you, but there's a bit of an echo. Um, I don't know. Oh, sorry. I don't know if it's a, if it's a, the mic you're wearing or 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 what, but um, is that is that any better or different or worse? Um, I think it's a little better. Sorry um, about that. Um, but I, you know, we we could we could understand everything you're saying. So so th um, so this is these are the preparatory. So these would be these were Wilkinson's drawings, correct? And yeah. th that he then sends to um, Wells, who's the engraver. Wells, we're guessing this is just this is Jeff's uh, conjecture, which I, I think is is right. Um, since Wilkinson, you know, either wasn't good at drawing f figures, or uh, you know, maybe there was a decision later on to add these figures. It, it appears that someone else was brought in to draw these. Um, at which point, then they create the engravings. The engravings are um, the drafts of them are sent to. Wordsworth, uh, do you have do you have the proofs of those? I do. Just while you were talking, if we just go back for a second to the first letter, um, this is the letter that you, you were reading from, and these are two of the subscribers that Wilkinson has acquired for Coleridge, for Coleridge's friend. And one of them is going to be like fine, and one of them is Mr. Wells. Well, Mr. Wells goes on to be the engraver, as it were, the, the printmaker, and Mr. Fine. Uh, is known for his drawings of, of working people in the microphone, as it were. So you just wonder, maybe while this is taking my mind, has Wilkinson been talking to Fine and Wells about the prints? And by the by, he's gotten the subscribers to the friend in the course of their conversations. So, so maybe these little drawings are by the new age Fine. Um, anyway, if we move on to the, 
Here are the proofs. So that this uh, was quite this I mentioned before about the spiller interest, but it was a help with the spiller interest from a, um, a private collector in Cambridge, uh, who very okay, that's that is a very reasonable price. Uh, but this is another wonderful piece of acquisition. But that's the same picture uh, from the water filter to the preparatory drawing through to the etching. And because it's a, a proof, of course, it's, it's in its very good form. So this is a lovely black and white print that we kept. But you notice that there's no title. The title hasn't yet been in um, And those are the ones where we could see at the bottom just the early, uh, some of the early, I think this is the series where it's it's just very uh, crude descriptions. They spell the uh, the publisher who's Ackerman. Uh, they publish spell his name I think differently in almost every one of them. <laughs> um, so these these are very much the rough the drafts. But this is go back to Simon's question about. So Wordsworth has finished his introduction. Now he is receiving. Um, at least the plan is he's going to receive. A, copies of these um, engravings as they're finished for him then to write supplementary text. Well, something breaks down in the process. Um, and um, part of it, I, th I think, are just delays on the engraver's end. Um, part of it is that, that Wordsworth um, pretty clearly by early um, 1810 has just done with uh, the pen for hire <laughs> role. Um, he just wants to get back to, you know, his poetry or other things, and, and he begins begrudging this and writes a um, fairly nasty uh, account of Wilkinson's art to his friend and patron, uh, Lady Beaumont. Um, and we find, and we'll discuss this uh, a little bit more later, um, by the time we're getting into late 1810, as um, Wordsworth's contributions are, are, are really past to do, and he's kind of holding up the process. Seems fairly clear that at that point he just uh, threw up his hands and asked Dorothy to finish his contributions for him. So, um, you know, Wordsworth again, you know, I, I think uh, responded fairly well at the beginning to this unusual relationship, but. Um, was done with it. And as far as we know, I mean, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear he never again would um, enter into a sort of relationship like this again. Um, it just, you know, didn't, didn't suit him. So do, do we know, Nick, how things looked sort of from Wilkinson's side? I mean, you've given the account of how it was for, for Wordsworth there, but, you know, for Wilkinson, from what you're saying, you know, not an especially well-known or, you know, highly rated, um, artist this uh, this it seems like a fantastic coup to get as your your you know your co-writer um you know William William Wordsworth um a pretty well known um figure by then who you know presume presumably um lends an awful lot of kudos to the whole project uh, it's a bit like you know getting Chris Bonington to write the preface to your mountaineering book or something like that which is, <laughs> which is doing quite quite a lot so I mean does does it does it help Wilkinson's project having Wordsworth on board you know, that, that was uh, certainly my assumption um, going in, you know, when I didn't know, when I knew about it, but didn't know that much about it was, um, you know, wh why, why, you know, for an introduction to your book, I mean, you're a minister, you're Oxford educated, you, you could write it reasonably your, well yourself. Why do you reach out to, to Coleridge and Wordsworth? Now who, you know, you know granted at this time, 1809, 1810, um, Coleridge was the more famous of the two, um, but, but they, they were kind of at least B-list poets in the <laughs> national conscience, and enough to be made fun of by Byron, you know, and and um, and so I just assumed that that the idea was again to kind of get a feather in his cap and to to boost sales. But um, when I started diving into it more carefully, and this is my you mentioned the my. Uh, a, a book I published a few years ago on literary advertising. Uh, kind of part of my, my instinct was to go and look at the ads. And uh, Jeff, I'm gonna share my screen here. That's okay. I'll stop uh, I'm gonna show you, so this, this is, um, I'm gonna show you, uh, this is a screen from uh, 
the actual edition that we're going to be talking about more in a bit. Um, but uh, this, by the way, is a nice uh, BYU magazine did a full uh, feature story on uh, some of these great experiences our students have had over the years, both interning and uh, doing workshops with Jeff and others there in, in the Jerwood Center. Reminds you of a day long ago <laughs> when Americans were allowed to cross the ocean. Um, so, uh, but if you, um, this by the way is a the, the nasty letter that Wordsworth wrote to Lady Beaumont uh, where he's just totally frustrated. This is the 10th of May, 1810, in which he, he describes of Wilkinson's uh, etchings. He says, the drawings or etchings or whatever they may be called are I know such as to you and Sir George must be intolerable. You will receive from them that sort of disgust which I do from bad poetry. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's clearly um, fed up with it. Um, but these are the advertisements I was talking about, you know, to go to your uh, question, Simon, about what do we, uh, you know, you, you would assume that this was a bit of a coup for him to get this. Well, these are the, these are the last set of ads that came out. Um, one's uh, August 1809, so about two months after uh, Wordsworth had signed on to the project. And then here's one right before it begins to be serialized. And we're gonna talk more about the serialization later. Um, but if you look in here, you'll see that uh, the ad, you know, describes what it is, sketches of uh, Cumberland, Westmoreland and Lancashire um, by Wilkinson. Um, it gives kind of the production qualities of it. It features Wells uh, as the engraver and it goes down and kind of gives the production schedule and the cost. And then it says published for the Reverend Joseph Wilkinson by Rudolf Ackerman, who was um, not quite, but he was on the verge of being kind of the absolute dominant publisher in Britain of um, art prints. Um, and um, all we get about the prose introduction is just this really short um, bit here about with appropriate letter press description. So he's named, he's dropped all of these names, but the one name that's not dropped is William Wordsworth, um, which is just kind of a, a, a head scratcher um, but what, but I think uh, finally the light on went on for me and it was just a few years ago that, um, that and this was a breakthrough for me and, and um, is that the dynamic here is that uh, Wilkinson's um, Select Views project was at the end of the day, a vanity press publication, a vanity publication. Mm -hmm. And Accordingly, as a vanity publication, the idea is not to shine the spotlight on the person who wrote your prose text, but in ways to make readers think that the prose text was yours. Um, and therefore, what Wordsworth's role was, was what, um, it's a term that wouldn't be, be coined a century later, but he was essentially a ghostwriter. Um, is the, it, nowhere in the text is Wordsworth's name mentioned nowhere in the advertisements for it. Um, and so um, it, it's a, you know, kind of a, a fascinating kind of uh, side angle to it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was kind of Wilkinson's motivations as far as we go. That, that is very interesting. And, uh, you know, people are expressing similar surprise to myself at that, at that history um, there. Um, so what Jeff's been showing us, I think, uh, was that the, the large volume of select views you were showing us? At the it, end, at it the was. End. It, 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 people are saying that it's difficult to hear this microphone. Is that? That's is it okay now? now? No, we can it's hear okay that now. Well. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. It so what we looked at. It's been yeah, a, what, I think it's been a problem just when you've been up and moving. Um, I'm sorry somewhere. about that. Okay. Yeah. So we just looked at the proof there, Simon. So those are the the yeah. proofs bound up, but we haven't yet looked at. Uh, a copy of the book as a whole, if you'd, if you'd like to do that. So now would be a great time for uh, Nick to talk us through that. Um, it works for you, Jeff. Surely. Okay, so so the, uh, you're, you're pulling out, uh, is this select views we're looking at? It will be. Yeah. OK. This is, this isn't, yeah, let's try that. 
Okay, yeah, so this, I'm glad you're showing us this, Jeff. So this is the uh, only note that we have between Wordsworth and Wilkinson after the publication of this volume. And it's inscribed here in what would have been kind of a presentation copy of the series to Wordsworth after the entire, all, all of, you know, the whole thing had been serialized by this point. And Wilkinson writes, uh, William Wordsworth Esquire from his faithful and obliged friend, Joseph Wilkinson. And, but um, again, there, there's no evidence. And I think we, we would, there would be evidence if there was any relationship afterwards. And it just seems like they'd had a, a falling out. Now, the degree to which Wordsworth um, did not uh, really prize his, uh, his involvement with this series or, you know, um, you know, play, give this pride of place on his bookshelves is, you know, first off, we're seeing here again the, on the cover page, no, no mention at all of uh, William Wordsworth's doesn't, name doesn't appear. If you flip to the beginning, um, Jeff, if you turn to the beginning of the, of the letter press. Um, so uh, this is the dedication um, that, that um, Wilkinson writes to you know, it's essentially a, an influential friend of his as you encouraged his art. And here, here's where Wordsworth's text begins. And uh, there's, every, every indication is that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, either you're purely anonymous or it's Wilkinson himself who, who wrote this. Wordsworth's name is never mentioned in this. Um, so this is uh, what Jeff's showing us is a volume, and I'm, I'm, again, we'll discuss this more in a bit, but um, after all of the different um, monthly numbers had been shipped to subscribers, they would be, uh, the uh, pages would be rearranged and bound in these volumes. And what's really quite impressive about these volumes, and you just don't, there's no way to get a sense of this from scans online. It's just the pure heft of them. I mean, these are folio pages. If anything, they're kind of, um, uh, there's, a, there's a bibliographer's term for this. Uh, it's like folio plus or something like that. Um, and you, you just look at the amount of white space here at a time when paper remains extremely expensive. You know, we don't yet have wood-based paper. Um, it's, uh, these pages are, I mean, Jeff, Jeff, you could even hold your hand up to it to just give a, a sense of scale or something. I mean, uh, if you were to lay this out, this is not a, this, this is not a kind of a casual guidebook. This is not something you put in, you know, in your pocket or even in your, you know, your satchel as you're going out to wander the hills. And so it's this really strange um, mismatch between Wordsworth's text, which he sort of wrote it as if it were a Gray's or a West guidebook, and its original publication format, which is a fine kind of gentleman's library edition. Um, I mean, the book, I, I think we literally weighed one of these copies, Jeff, if I remember. I mean, and it, um, you wouldn't get very far unless you were really uh, in great physical shape walking the hills with this in hand. Um, Jeff, anything? What am I forgetting about this uh, about this edition? Well, can you hear me if I speak? Right? Uh, with a little bit of an echo, but we can hear you. Oh no, this is what we were going to talk about. Okay, yeah, this, this, I'm, I'm glad. You, so, the, going back to the point about how Wordsworth, <clears throat> you know, wasn't exactly. Um, invested in keeping a pristine copy of his essay. Uh, in the years ahead, sort of late 18 teens, um, six, seven, eight years after select views had appeared, Wordsworth decides um, that he is going to repurpose this and publish it in, under his own name and goes about revising it. And um, he literally revises it here in pencil in the margins of this um, presentation copy that he has from Wilkinson's. So it's really nice. We don't have, we have, as far as I know, we have very few manuscript pages. We have some, but very few manuscript pages of his original 1810 essay. But here um, we see the revision process 
you know, kind of in, in full form within the 1810 text itself. Um, this then would lead the way for uh, the next iteration of what we now know as the Guide to the Lakes, which would be the one where Wordsworth first published it under his own name. And this came in 1820. Um, you know, and, and the, the important point to make here is, is that this is really an evolution of a text into a guidebook. So, you know, it begins as an, a, as a ghost written introduction to a very limited run, super expensive art print series. Wordsworth then revises it, but rather than publishing it as a guidebook, he publishes it in his River Dunnett. Uh, can we look at the title page, Jeff? Mm. Um, so this is the 1820 uh, River Dudden's sonnet collection. And you'll see that it is River Dudden, um, series of sonnets, Vaudricourt and Julia and other poems to which is uh, annexed a topographical description of the country of the lakes in the north of England. Well, this is, um, the bulk of this is uh, repurposed from his 1810 um, introduction to Wilkinson. There's no, there's no record at all of any, um, you know, request to Wilkinson that he'd be able to use his text. I think just the assumption was that the sale of Wilkinson's product had, it had had its moment. And so Wordsworth then publishes this topographical description, but it's really 1822, um, which is what we now consider the third edition of the guide where it makes its next big leap forward. So this is the first time um, here in the third edition where it becomes a standalone book of its own. Um, again, we still don't see guide in the title, the description of the scenery of the lakes in the north of England, third edition. So he's, he's acknowledging here a continuity back to the 1810, even though no one you know, really knew he'd written the 1810. Um, and this sells really well. Um, part of its Wordsworth's name is starting to get, you know, a little bit of appeal, the ongoing appeal of the lakes. This was a small printing, I believe it was 500. And it sells quickly enough that Wordsworth then immediately, once again, expands it. Oh, that's nice. That, uh, I'm assuming, what do you, what can we assume about that binding, Jeff? Is that, would that have been, been a, a private library binding? This one, I think, is the, um, is the, is the sort of, you know, like the cheap edition. This is the okay. paperback edition. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that okay. really is portable, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's in board still is probably how it would be described. It's just, um, it's just paper. It's like the okay. thinnest, of, thinnest of cards. Well, that's interesting. That's not that's something I've thought about much, but that's another reason to go to the Jerwood Center and to see all of the different versions. So a year later, then he produces the fourth edition, um, and again uh, publishes this with his London publisher Longman, who is, you know, one of the powerhouse publishers of the era. And this is expanded once again. Does this one have a map in it? it does. Okay, so this uh, did the. I don't remember. I don't think there was a map in the third edition, was there? No. Okay, so we're. Oh yes, there is. There is. I'm oh, sorry. There is. Okay, so we're seeing. This is where uh, we need. Well, I'm going to bring in Paul West over here in a bit, but he knows this end of it better than I do. But um, this is where we see this kind of this gradual um, kind of tranching down of the text, becoming, you know, truly a guidebook, but also the it taking on these accoutrements of what you would expect in a travel guide. Um, this is the first, we're still, we're looking at the third edition here, right? Um, yeah. You look in the table of contents here, you'll see as part of his adding content so that he could, you know, sell it as a standalone book. Um, if you go to the next page, um, he adds here the miscellaneous, let me see, does this have the, this has one of the excursions in it. Yeah, there we see it. The, the miscellaneous observation he adds Ascent to the top of Scoffell, um, which was an account that Dorothy wrote that um, we're gonna talk about later. Paul, Paul's gonna discuss that. That's, uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Nick, have I interrupted you there? No, no, that's fine. And then, uh, you know, if we were to look at the next, uh, is, is that the, 
Wait, are you, is that the third edition still you're holding? Yeah, your this, is, this is the fourth edition. Okay. Third edition, sorry. The fourth edition, then he adds another of uh, one of Dorothy's um, uh, excursions uh, along the way to the ultimate fifth edition. So. I'm sorry, Nick. I, I think I showed the uh, the third edition twice. So I beg your pardon. So, so Nick, I mean, you've you've beautifully moved us. We started, as I remember, with the 1835, which was that the small edition, and you've taken us back to the the magnificent folio, which um, Bruce Graver tells us elephant folio apparently is the word for the yeah. bibliographers yeah. for those. And then we've moved through 1810, 1820, 1822, 1823, 1835. Um, you mentioned that it's that it's sort of selling well, um, starting to sell well. I mean, I guess you know, two questions. If I could ask you to reflect on um, one is is can you say any more about its sort of popularity at the time? Um, yeah. But also, I suppose you know, um, fantastic to see the historical objects um, and the history. But you know how. Yeah, how valuable would you say it remains, you know, for us today um, as a sort of account of the late history? I mean, I mean, Connor earlier sent a message in which I might just incorporate into this as a question. You know, he he was asking, um, you know, this is Connor James saying, uh, may I ask Nick whether he feels that eco-criticism is a useful mode of reading to apply to the guide of the legs? And so I just want, you know, does, does, do you feel the volume has that kind of value? For us today, yeah. Let me actually show. You, I, that's a good good opportunity to show you uh, another section of this uh, website, which we'll be discussing again uh, more after the break. So this is the, those images I showed you before of the advertisements. They're they're embedded in um, the introduction uh, to our Romantic Circles edition. Um, but if you go to um, another section of this edition is this annotated bibliography uh, that we created. And this is a great way to kind of trace the reception history of the guide. And so, and we've got very standard editions here, but um, you know, and what biographers say about it, but here, here are kind of the early reviews of the guide, um, what we know as the guide. And several of them are by John Wilson, um, Wordsworth's one-time disciple and kind of occasional friend at this point in life. Um, but uh, Wilson thought very, very highly of uh, this essay when it first came out. But uh, more or less across the board, including a monthly review essay a, uh, or re monthly review um, critique of the River Dudden collection, which didn't have much good to say about the poetry, but ended by saying, the tour of the lake seems to us to be as topographically useful as it is poetically picturesque. Um, on down, you now kind of one of the, the most famous kind of uh, anecdotes about the Guide to the Lakes comes in Matthew Arnold, um, who Arnold, of course, uh, lived, spent summers uh, in the Rydal area when he was young and knew Wordsworth from then. Um, and he would later create this edition of Wordsworth's poems in which in the preface, he told uh, presumably from kind of firsthand experience about how one of the pilgrims to Rydal Mount, the clergyman, asked Wordsworth if he had ever written anything beside the guide to the lakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is kind of a, you know, a, a famous anecdote about the guide and it, and it implies that it was, you know, just this absolute bestseller. I, I think that would be an overstatement. In fact, if you go back and you look at the, the edition history, um, so, we had the 1822 third edition, 1823 fourth edition, but it's not till 1835 that we get a fifth edition. Um, and what becomes clear is that uh, I believe the fifth edition was, or th fourth edition was 1500 copies, it's either 1000 or 1500. Um, and it, it sold relatively well, but it long went overestimated the demand for it. And so um, and there's this, another fun thing to trace in the advertisements. You see, like in the early 1830s, every summer holiday season, as people are getting ready for their trips up to the lakes, uh, Long, Longman takes to the London newspapers to advertise, just published, William Wordsworth's Guide to the Lakes. And he's trying to clear out his back stock of the 1823 edition. And so when it finally exa is exhausted in 1835, 
um, Wordsworth wants to, you know, you know, is really invested in this, has stuff he wants to add, update. And Longman says, eh, you know, not for me. And that's when it, be, uh, that's when the Kendall uh, publishers, Hudson and Nicholson sign on. And it really then becomes kind of a local product at that point. I mean, it's to be sold in the lakes. Um, and that, that edition sells quite well. Um, so to fast forward, um, you know, again, go back to, and, and that's a good question about the, the eco-critical angles. If you go back to this annotated bibliography that we created. Um, Just to say, Nick, for, for some of the audience that um, Hannah's helpfully put up the link to, to this, but this is the, the virtual edition of Guide to the Lakes that's freely open to everybody, isn't it? But yeah, that's right. Type into Google, Romantic Circles, Guide to the Lakes. That will take them to this magnificent digital edition that you've created with all this material. Yep, and, and I'll be show, I'll, I'll show various features of that here in a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, so we, 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 this is just updated through 2015, uh, but it, it gets pretty much all of the important commentary on the guide. And we've got a whole section um, of eco-critical writings, um, which honestly, I mean, you know, my opinions are, are, are a bit of a mixed bag. There's some really brilliant pieces, but really the, the one of note, um, and, and in ways you could say that this is a kind of a top five moment in the reception history of the guide, if not a top three moment. 1991, um, Jonathan Bate, you know, famous scholar uh, now in a book which has gone on to be, you know, on a very, very short list of the most important books of eco-criticism um, ever published in, so Romantic Ecology um, has a major section of the book is focused on the Guide to the Lakes, um, which he calls it an exemplar of the Romantic Ecology and um, we'll, I'll read this whole quote because this, this answers that question so directly. To think for a moment of Wordsworth as preeminently not the author of Tintern Abbey and the Prelude, but the compiler of the Guide to the Lakes will thus be not only to recover an important 19th century view of him, but also to begin to move away from narrow canonicity. If we were to historicize romanticism, we must bring the guide from the periphery to the center. The neglect of it is quite extraordinary. And you know, not only kind of this clarion call, but 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 being in this book that still is being read and taught, um, has shifted. The, 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 I think the bulk. You could, it's fair to say the bulk of, of 21st century commentary so far on the guide has been explicitly in a kind of eco-critical vein. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. So. Um... And it's a nice moment for us because Jonathan, of course, was the first of our disparate romantics in this in this series. So, so you provided a lovely uh, link back there. Um, so that's been a a, a, a masterful uh, tour of the editions uh, and the history of the guide guide to the lakes. Thanks so much. Um, in our excitement, we sort of whizzed through what we planned to be the break there, and we've sort of got <laughs> the twenty minutes left. Um, so, which is which is which is fine. I'm sure people are, are still still with us, but I might hand over to Jeff because I know he mm. wants to talk to you about sort of the modern editing and you know particularly to focus on this resource of the of the web the website that you've created. Just before we do, I don't want people to miss out on the, that fourth edition. So there's there's the fourth edition, which again is in a lovely paper cover. Um, it's, it's just a a lovely a lovely little book. But there's there's the fourth edition. So I'm sorry. You know, on the back of that. Are are those advertisements for other guidebooks on the back or other? No, long they're ad advertisements for Wordsworth, miscellaneous poems, ecclesiastical sketches, memorials of a tour of the continent and the excursion. So if you if you like the guide, that's what you can <laughs> that's what you can go and read. Yeah, which is it's a lovely book. These paper covers are just wonderful. I mean, in terms of making sense of the of, of the guide as a text, um, I mean, until your edition came along, th this is the one that we relied on. And uh, it's all the variations are in footnotes. It's 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 a very complex story, but it's very, also very difficult to follow. So I wonder, Nick, if you if you could tell us sort of what prompted your project uh, in the first place. So um, this is one of those one of those great moments that administrators love to hear about when um, research comes directly out of one's teaching and um, and that not only are students inspired by professors but vice versa. 
So um, Paul Westover and I were working with this uh, fantastic master's student here at BYU, Shannon Stimson, um, who was interested in the interplay of kind of aesthetics, both in, in art and in nature. And I suggested that she look at the Guide to the Lakes, which is a text I, kn I knew fairly well, but I hadn't written anything on it. Um, and she dived into it and got really interested in it and wrote this fantastic master's thesis about it. And in the defense, um, we were talking about, you know, the highs and lows of her experience. And she mentioned that um, it was just inexplicable to her how hard she had to work to, and this would have been 2011, I guess, um, to track down um, the Wilkinson images. Um, they'd never, the, the original 1810 edition of this book that had gone on to be seen as kind of one of arguably Wordsworth's most important book of prose, um, the 1810 edition only existed in, in its original printing, um, of which, you know, by my count, there are about 30 uh, archives in the world that own a copy of. So it just, especially for an undergraduate, it was impossible to get to. And so Paul and I, had a light bulb go on above our heads and say, well, you know, Shannon's already done a lot of the legwork here. Why don't the three of us pitch in and um, and make this thing accessible? From So from the very beginning, um, our impulse was access. I mean, fortunately, in my case, you know, I, 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 I think Paul was about to get tenure at the time and I had tenure. And so there was less of the kind of the publisher parish as far as needing to go with an Oxford University Press edition or something like that. The goal was to, how can we expose more people to the Guide to the Lakes? And that's what led us, you know, initially in 2011 to come spend an afternoon with you, um, in which you showed us a lot of the things we've been sharing with people today. Um, and, uh, you know, from there, it's kind of expanded outward uh, in all sorts of ways. So is this, is this a moment to, to share the screen and, and sort of give us an overview of it? Because it went through one version and then you, re, you returned to it. Yeah, let me do this. So let me show you this. So, so the, um, going back to this, uh, this is, uh, again, the uh, Romantic Circles edition, which is, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like Hannah has shared the, uh, a screenshot of the this so this is uh, this is the homepage of the new edition so um this is a 2020 edition which just came out a, a six months ago or something like that uh the original edition of this was 2015 and it was quite good we were proud of it we spent we, we, um for an for a web edition it it was unusually ambitious in fact when romantic circles published this um neil freist uh, you know wrote a really nice release memo saying that kind of it, it, it represented the kind of a big step forward for romantic circles editions. Um, but so in that first edition, we had uh, kind of a lot of its strengths were, for instance, this, this is the 1835 edition where we not only um, provided a full tr transcription of it, but as you'll see embedded within it are all sorts of images. Um, uh, how did I, uh, oh, that took me to the end. I think it's kind of be my, I'm on a smaller screen here, but, um, uh, and within the body of the text, we had, uh, various photos either that we had taken, our students had taken, or, um, we also tried to embed, uh, various, well, so some of these are photos, but we, we've got various images along the way within the text of, for those who uh, aren't within the lakes, uh, see if I can find one of uh, where we've got like 19th century or 18th century uh, prints in it. Um, and then we also have uh, annotations all the way through. So it's, it's a really nice reading text and te teaching text. Um, beyond that, as we saw a minute ago, um, we included uh, features like this annotated bibliography, uh, so, uh, and a, a good overview introduction to it. Um, Paul also, uh, Paul Westover, uh, 
was responsible for this feature of it, which is kind of a, a fun place to, so the, the guide just alludes to all sorts of sites within the region. And Paul went through and created this uh, geotracking feature in which you can not only, you know, identify where a particular place mentioned in the guide is on a modern day map, but well, that's not a good example. Let's we wouldn't do Ambleside. Um, uh, well, on a modern map, but then you can also do an overlay of an 1800 map where it falls on, or mm -hmm. he's included the, um, that's why I should have had him talking about maps. Um, here's here's the that map, the pullout map from the third edition um, as well. So that's, we were really happy with that, but the, um, one advantage, I guess, and it's, I guess we also a disadvantage of a digital edition is it's, it's relatively easy to update, you know, so we made a little minor tweaks where we caught, um, you know, silly mistakes. Um, but um, when it came out in 2015, um, we were really gratified by a lot of nice things that colleagues said about it. Um, it was clear it was getting good use. But uh, one suggestion, for instance, that people made was that, okay, you gave us the 1810 text, you gave us a, a transcription of it, that, that's helpful. Um, and you gave us the thing that we really wanted to make sure people had access to were, were the Wilkinson images. Um, but why didn't you, you know, give us Wordsworth's letterpress printing, which still to this day is not available on Google Books or other than I think as far as I know, the only place that this has been digitized is on this site. And so th this is something we've added for the second edition. But the big thing that the thing that I spent a number of years working on is I, I realized, um, you know, 2016 or so that the account we had given of the, of the 1810 publication was wrong. Now, I mean, we weren't the first to get this wrong. Um, I mean, we were largely kind of drafting off what other people had said. But the mistake that we'd made was that um, we sort of were thinking about select views like we would about any other book. We were thinking about it as something, you know, that was produced for a mass market, that was trying to get as many readers as possible. Um, and uh, we, didn't really quite have a full sense of the way the serialization of it worked. And so come 2016, I'm starting to realize that, you know, the, this just isn't adding up. And so I wrote Jeff, Jeff and I had an exchange about it and he put us in, put me in touch with Mark Reed, um, the great Wordsworthian scholar, um, recently retired a few years back from the University of North Carolina, I wrote the great bibliography of Wordsworth. And, and Mark, uh, you know, gratefully, you know, and, and, and kindly um, with every time I would throw in a hypothesis past him, um, an alternate hypothesis about his publication, he would say, nope, wrong, nope, wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and slowly I started getting closer and closer to the truth. And one of the key questions we were still pursuing was exactly when Wordsworth's um, letterpress was first serialized. Um, there were, most scholars had assumed based on a letter from Lady Beaumont who mentions reading Wordsworth's text um, in May that had been, all been serialized by then. But um, that didn't add up. Mark, on the other hand, this was the only time in which he was wrong. Um, otherwise he was always right. Mark, Mark suggested that they would have left the entire letter press until the very end after all of the images have come out serially four at a time you know over the 12 months of 1810 then they would get wordsworth's letter press to bind together with the images um but there were there were holes in that which then speaking of holes um led <laughs> led me in 20 uh 2016 the fall of 2016 i think it was maybe 2017 one of the two um i was it in Grasmere for a conference we were holding at the Wordsworth Trust and Jeff and I set out to answer, what could we tell from the artifacts they have in the Jerwood? What, what could we tell about the sequence in which Wordsworth's letterpress was published? Nick, I'm gonna stop you just for a second because I'm gonna go and change cameras and then we can you can talk through, okay. 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 Um, 
So let me just share a screen and then you can talk about the actual thing. So for me, part of the, the mystery was um, how if this thing were serialized, uh, you know, with four prints and a few pages of the letterpress at a time, how is it that the copies of the select views that have survived are more or less uniform in terms of the way in which the pages are ordered, the prints are ordered, they're a rarely kind of a missing print here or there that, you know, got taken away by the dog um, or the family dog or something. And so the uniformity of it was really puzzling to me. Um, but we'd started by this point to, to think that Wordsworth's um, introductory essay had been shipped piecemeal. And we were looking at these copies and Jeff had this, this great idea. So you want to tell him about um, what we're looking at there? Can you hear me okay? That's my only worry. Uh, here, it's a little bit soft. Do you want me to talk, keep talking well, or? I think if you talk through it, uh, okay. rather than maybe muffled. Yeah, is that okay? Okay. So what we knew was that um, various repositories have these wrappers in which the serial uh, images were sent. And if you look at the title, the cover page of these, there are 12 of these wrappers. Um, they would appear at the beginning of each month of 1810 and they would list on the on the cover um, if you look there at the very bottom of the screen there the four prints that were included that month and um, so we knew that and we also see right below the the main title it says right above the Joe the Wilkinson with appropriate letterpress description so the assumption was that some of Wordsworth's text was in there um, and so um, we thought, well, how could we figure out which pages appeared in which wrapper? And this is where I'm pretty sure it was you, Jeff, who had this idea. Do you have any of the loose bound, those loose bound pages we looked at? There we are. So let's. Uh... Okay, so so this is you. You got the second installment. Do they have the prints within the second installment, or is that just the the? We letter? just have the letter press. We just simply have the letter press. But here we can see, I hope, uh, that the holes. You see the holes and the stitching. So there's the letter press. There's the letter press. There's the cover for the wrapper for the section that was sold, and you can see that the stitching and the holes match up. And so we were able to look at the, the, the those hand sewn holes in the page, their pages of the letterpress, and we could tell exactly which pages um, shipped in which month. Um, th this was like uh, really exciting because it you know it, it seemed to discount on the one hand the idea that. You know, where the Guide to the Lakes first appeared at the very end of 1810 or on the other end at the very beginning. And um, this is the one moment where um, a big breakthrough came for me in a library besides the Wordsworth Trust. So Jeff had kind of keyed me into this. And a few months later, I happened to be at Yale, at the Yale Center for British Art. And they had, um, as far as I know, the only surviving set in which all 12 numbers were never removed from their shipping wrappers. And we were able to confirm that Wordsworth's letterpress came out four pages at a time exactly. Um, you know, it would end mid paragraph or mid sentence. Um, and um, as a result of that, then, um, if we go to uh, Jeff, I'm going to um, go back to our edition here uh, just for a second. Yeah. So uh, if you go back to this, is the, our new edition. I've added this essay um, on the serial publication of select views in which um, it really it's for those who are interested in romantic book history and publishing history. This is a branch of it. We just um, know relatively little about. I mean, it seems like those who work on, on poetry and, and novels know that version of publishing and those in the arts world know that version, but we don't often get together. Well, um, what I've done here is I've been able to 
you know, there's all sorts of details in here, but at the very end of this, I've given a sense of exactly, you know, the order in which both the engravings and the letterpress were serialized. Um, let me show you one other thing, because I know we want to we want to talk about uh, a couple of other. I know we want to talk about Dorothy Wordsworth for a minute. I want to get Paul in here, but let me show you one last feature that will be useful for uh, those who are studying the guide. So within our edition, we've embedded a um, we've embedded a PDF that. Um, I nearly went bump blind completing back in the day, but for those who are interested in tracking the evolution of the Guide to the Lakes, um, really the best technology I could find, unfortunately still, was just uh, basically the, the, the old uh, spreadsheet, essentially. And what I've done here is uh, I've tracked the development of the Guide across the five editions. And one of the things you learn here is the degree to which the um, uh, the, the degree to which the 1810 text really remained the core of the text all the way through. And so there still tends to be a little bit of a, a tendency since scholars just use the 1835 text to think of this as a text from the 1830s or at least the 1820s. But you see, especially in these sections, I mean, just the core of the text um, is, is there already in 1810 and there are various supplementary features later. But those, those who are really interested in this textual history will want to look at this, so. I mean, that, that really is a fantastic thing, as I say, compared to the, the printed edition that we had before, which was almost, I mean, it was there, but it was really difficult to follow. This is, this is a fantastic thing to see how the, the sections are added, how the emphasis is added, to see how the annotations from Wordsworth's you know, own copy come into it. It, it, is, it is really a fantastic thing. Um, uh, but I, I, just, I just wanted to um, come in on the stitching holes because I didn't know any of that. I've not seen that before. I mean, that seems to me um, you know, a brilliant example of the ongoing value of the archive, you know, the need for the physical object of the book. Um, but then you made such fantastic use of Nick, in producing this resource that's available to everybody. So it's a lovely example of the archive and digital editing um, working together. But I wonder if I could just, I, I was looking just the other day at the parallel text you've just been showing us, and it shows very clearly, very interestingly, the moment at which William includes what we now know to be Dorothy's account of the climb of, of Scarfell Pike. And it then shows how in the, one of the later editions, he adds a poem along, alongside that. And we've had a question from Martha Lang, which I think will be the last question we've got time for, uh, unfortunately. But you know, she was asking about, you know, what's Dorothy's role in the production um, of the guide? So I don't know if you want to hand this over to Paul or ask uh, you know, to deal specifically with the Scarfell Pike business or talk more generally about Dorothy. Yeah, I'd love, um, I, I don't know if, uh, if I, I, I know Paul's in the audience, if we can get uh, Paul uh, to be able to speak here, because uh, this is an area where uh, Paul is, for another project we're doing on Dorothy Wordsworth has become um, really the, he knows more about this than I, than I do. Um, the, one, the one thing I can say, and this, this would be, um, don't know quite how you would approach this, but no one has written about um, the fact that it's pretty clear from letters that, that Dorothy wrote a significant section of William's final set of contributions for select views in 1810. And that's always just been treated purely as Williams. And mm -hmm. the letters show that William's essentially foisting this off on her because he wants nothing more to do with this project. And so that's one branch of it. But even you know more straightforward uh, textual history are these excursions um, that William adds in 1822 and 23. Paul, do you want to talk about those? I, I don't know if Certainly. you're yes. The Invisible Man appears. Right. Well, so I, I know that we're running short on time, but to to answer the question in a global way, and then I'll I'll get a little bit more granular in the way you've just proposed. Uh, by my calculations, 
Dorothy Wordsworth wrote at least 13% of the Guide to the Lakes by the time you get to the 1835 edition. So it's substantially a, a co-authored work. And I think what happens is when Wordsworth decides to do a standalone guidebook in 1822, and by the way, Dorothy has been encouraging him to do this for several years, realizing that this might be more lucrative than his poetry. So he finally gives in. Uh, but at that time, I think they realized that it's a little bit too short to be a book on its own. And so the question is, well, how do we pad it out? And the answer is, well, let's go to Dorothy's notebooks because she has some of these wonderful travel narratives. So the first one is her account of climbing Scottville Pike with her friend Mary Barker uh, in 1818. And Wordsworth uh, includes an edited version of that in the 1822, which is received quite well, as you've heard. And I, I quite like that fact because it means that Dorothy's account becomes the climax of the book in 1822. You sort of literally end on the mountaintop and there's nothing after that except the tacked on itinerary uh, that uh, Wordsworth sort of grudgingly adds in. Uh, and then since the 1822 sells well, they say, well, what are we going to do to make the next edition new and improved? Answer, go back to the notebook because we also have this lovely account that Dorothy wrote about their Oldswater tour back in 1805. And so that gets that added in. And now there's a new section in the table of contents called excursions. And that becomes the climax of the fourth edition. And that's all Dorothy's stuff, right? And then as you've heard in the fifth edition, William balances it out a little bit. He intersperses a couple of his own poems. So there's this conversation going on between brother and sister at the end. And, and that's more or less the final form of the book. But yeah, we, we wanted to do this Dorothy Wordsworth project in part as a kind of sequel to the Guide to the Lakes project because it became clear to us that Dorothy had had such a huge hand in it. So this is a chance for us to tease a, another Romantic Circles edition that we hope will come out in 2021. Um, but there are several features of it that have already been built. So if you're interested, for example, uh, I, I will drop a link in the chat we've created uh, an Esri story map that recreates Dorothy Wordsworth's route uh, up Scottville Pike. One of the things you realize is that Dorothy's version of the text is actually more interesting than Williams. You know, he, he has to take out all of the li little chatty anecdotes, the, the details about the people involved and just all the contextualization that you get in Dorothy's original. Uh, so we, we wanted to, to not just restore her authorship, but restore the richness of the text and help people sort of imagine the day she was describing. So uh, I will grab the link to the story map and put it in here. And you also, uh, you, uh, so Paul, Paul did that. I mean, you said we, that was a nice of you to use a we, but that's, that's all Paul. Um, and then, uh, you could also include that fantastic uh, film that the Wordsworth Trust made of the reenactment of Dorothy's uh, climb. Um. Yeah, and that was just a, a lucky stroke for me because when I started working on the 1818 Scottwell account, I started corresponding with Jeff about it. And he said, gosh, it's funny that you should ask about that because we're considering doing a reenactment. So I said, sign me up. and. We ended up having a, a tremendous experience and yeah, the, out of it came uh, a documentary film and this story map and a whole, a whole bunch of other spin-off projects from the people that were involved in it. So uh, we, we can share some of those things as well. But un unlike, um, yeah, unlike uh, uh, Dorothy, we didn't quite make it, did we, Paul? Um, <laughs> the the oh. weather, the weather rather got in our way. But yeah, um, she's somehow in October had a glorious day and it wasn't even yeah. windy. And anyone who goes up there knows that it's never that way. <laughs> I, I've been stymied within a half mile of the summit three times up there, been snowed on, rained on, blown on, but I've survived it. One of these days I'll actually stand on the summit, but I've, I've walked the rest of the route and taken lots of great photographs. So that's, that's a fun thing you can do with digital editing. You know, in, in a print edition, illustrations are so expensive but in a digital edition, you can illustrate to your heart's content. So we're hoping to create really rich ways of interacting with these texts that, that bring them to life for a new generation of readers. 
well, and, well, next, uh, sorry, next. we're also in that edition. Um, it, it will be texts that are some of which are known, um, but uh, it'll be new versions of them, like Paul was talking about the Scottfell manuscripts. Um, I'm also uh, kind of my main contribution to that Dorothy edition will be um, two of the volumes of the Rydal journals, which are uh, kind of inexplicably unpublished to this day. And so we'll get um, two years of Dorothy's life that we haven't had access to really before. There's a lot more to say about Dorothy, obviously, um, particularly as next year, it's Dorothy's 250th birthday anniversary. So certainly at, at Words with Grasmere, we'll, we'll be coming back to these, these writings um, and these interpretations then. Um, we do have to draw to a close. I'm afraid um, it's it's we've, we've reached the hour. It was cover very quickly. Um, just just to say a few closing remarks, if I could. Um, we must thank Hannah. Um, we Hannah um, has come in on a, 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 a. She's got a week off work. She's come in specially to help us run this evening. Um, she's promoted the series. She's tweeted as we've gone. She's given us a great welcome every week. Um, and as always, she's a great pleasure to work with. And Simon and I are both greatly indebted to Hannah, as, as each other, each of our guests have been as well. Um, Simon uh, and I have, have had these conversations. We agreed that we wouldn't thank each other. Uh, we thought, well, Ant doesn't thank Deck, and Morecambe didn't thank Wise, so we haven't thanked each other. So I'm just going to say that it's just been a great pleasure to have these conversations uh, with, with Simon and with our guests. And uh, there is, it, it looks spontaneous. Um, but there is preparation, and I can at least thank Simon for the time that he's put into those preparations. So, so thank you, Simon. Um, it's a, a special thank you to Nick. Um, that's been a, a wonderful walkthrough this evening. Um, you've just brought these collections alive. You've shown why they matter, and you've made use of them. You've interpreted them, and you're sharing them. Uh, and what a bonus it is to have Paul as well tonight. That, that's an unexpected pleasure, too. So, so good to see you, Paul, and, and thank you both very much. Um, just a reminder, I'm just going to say, because yeah. it is such uh, a lovely book, please, please do think about this book, um, £9.60, just for a, just for a few days, um, and uh, a, a very fun book to, to have. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Uh, those of you who particularly have been through, through the season series, there's a, there's a Scottish radio presenter who ends his show, and he always says, there's no point as being here unless you are. And I, and I think Simon and Hannah and I would say just the same. There's no point us being here unless you are. So, so thank you, everybody, for being with us th right through the series. Um, as Simon said before, if you have any thoughts and comments, um, please do let us know. Um, if you'd like us to consider doing more of these, please let us know and, and how we might do them. Um, and I think all that remains for us to say is to wish you well, uh, to have a, a safe and happy Christmas coming up. And uh, let's hope for a about a new year, uh, but in the meantime, I think just to, for us all to say good night and uh, very best to you all. Good night, everyone. So, Thank you night. very much. Bye. See you again soon, hopefully. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Nick. And Thank thanks, you. Paul. Thank you, Paul. And Thank, Thank you, you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Absolutely.